Good evening and welcome to tonight, Monday, October 2nd, 2023, City Council meeting. Um, I will ask June um, to take the roll. Mayor McCaffrey. Here. Assistant Mayor Kelly. Here. Councillor Tabor. Here. Councillor Denton. Here. Councillor Moreau. Here. Councillor Bagley. Here. Councillor Lombardi. Here. Councillor Blaylock. Here. Councillor Cook. Here. All here, Your Honor. Thank you, June. Um, and as we, uh, before we stand for the, the Pledge of Allegiance, I'd just like or to ask Portsmouth uh, to keep Kelly Barnaby, uh, who is not with us uh, this evening, uh, in your uh, in your hearts uh, and in your prayers. Um, she lost her father-in-law uh, this morning. Um, explains why June is with us uh, for her first council meeting. But Kelly, if you are watching at home, uh, we love you uh, and our condolences go out to you. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have a proclamation for fire prevention week and it explains why Chief McClellan is here dressed as well as he's dressed and he's <laughs> coming up uh, to receive this in a moment uh, but first whereas Portsmouth suffered major fires in 1802 1806 and 1813 that together destroyed 500 buildings and transformed the downtown streetscape from wood to brick while establishing a proud legacy of firefighting among the men and women of today's Portsmouth Fire Department and whereas, as demonstrated as recently as the State Street Saloon fire of 2017, the threat of catastrophic fire in Portsmouth remains very real. And whereas, the National Fire Prevention Association was founded in 1896 for fire protection, education, and to create what today are known as little safety codes that mandate fire safety, construction techniques, sprinklers, and smoke detectors, and whereas, sadly, despite ongoing fire prevention and fire safety efforts in education, in 2021, home fires killed more than 2,800 people in the United States, and fire departments in the United States responded to 338,000 home fires. And whereas cooking is the leading cause of home fires in the United States, with fire departments responding to more than 166,000 each year, where two to every five home fires started in the kitchen, and a third of those fires resulting from unattended cooking, and whereas last year we issued a mayor's award to two young residents in recognition of their bravery and quick thinking when they confronted in a fire emergency at their home, we said by remaining calm, knowing the right steps to take uh, to keep the fire from spreading and calling 911, you are a model fire prevention citizen or an example to the community. And whereas the 2023 fire prevention week themed is cooking safety starts with you, pay attention to fire prevention to remind us to stay alert to use caution when cooking to reduce the risk of kitchen fires. Now, therefore, I, Dago McCachran, Mayor of the City of Portsmouth, on behalf of the members of the City Council, the Portsmouth Fire Department, and the citizens of Portsmouth, do hereby proclaim October 8th through the 14th, 2023, as Fire Prevention Week in Portsmouth, and call upon our community to observe this month by thanking our Portsmouth Fire Department for their selfless dedication to fire safety, prevention, education, and emergency response given with my hand in the seal of the city of Portsmouth on the second day of October, 2023. And Bill, if you'd come be so kind to join us. It's easier to come up here than get a nice picture of the whole council. And you were wearing this beautiful. All right. We do not have any minutes uh, on for acceptance this evening uh, and no uh, recognition and volunteer committee reports. 
Uh, if I might, I'd like to uh, make a motion to suspend the rules to bring forward item 13 under presentations and written communication letter A. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, moving to 13A, presentation from Portsmouth Elk Lodge 97 regarding the Recreation Department grant, the amount of $3,000. Elise Gallo, would you please come up and... Uh, and present this wonderful yeah, grant. On oh, and we have a, we have a presentation. presentation. Oh, it's a presentation. Thank you, Council. Yeah, hold on a second. Um, thank you, City Manager and the public. Um, as you know, the Portsmouth Lodge 97 is on 500 Jones Ave. We have 1,804 members as of last Tuesday. And annually, we spend about 5,000 to 7,000 volunteer hours um, helping our community. You can go ahead and, I don't, do I have a clicker here? No. So the Benevolent Protective Order of Elks is not a 501c3, but we have a 501c3 arm, a nonprofit arm, the Elks National Foundation. And that's the foundation that I deal with the most. I am the grants coordinator for uh, the Portsmouth Lodge 97. Um, and I can apply for grants to serve the Seacoast community and do so regularly. I've been doing this for about four years. Um, our grants support youth, serve veterans, meet local needs, and build strength in the community. And every year we have the opportunity to apply for the various ENF grants. And we're here for you, and I want to talk about one of those grants, but also touch on some other grants we've done in the last few years. Next slide. Next. Next. So this year I worked with Todd um, at length in the spring. He was very helpful in providing data and some context um, regarding our lifeguard shortage, and I tried to figure out a way where we could help. And we applied for the gratitude grant. Um, it's a $3,000 grant, and that is to benefit um, lifeguard training programs. So this contribution will pay for the training and certification costs for about 7 to 18. They're usually 15 to 16-year-olds. And um, as they enter the Train to Hire Lifeguard program, they can become Red Cross certified lifeguards for the city pool. So that amount will help with that training program. So thank you, Todd. Right. <laughs> Um, I, I, I know you have to vote on him accepting that check, but he has it. <laughs> <laughs> this is an easy vote, Elise. <laughs> um, some of the other things we did this year, Lodge 97 was awarded a, the Beacon and Spotlight, a combined grant of $6,000, and we helped Operation Blessings Teen Summer Program, serving about 200 families in the Portsmouth Housing Authority. Um, the Elks members also constructed the uh, fitness and conditioning program, and that saved another $3,000. Um, but, and the grants all together, according to Ron um, Cimini, funded 75% of that teen program's um, expansion. We were really happy to do that for him. And he, that was a cold call. He basically called us out of the blue. Um, luckily, a week before, we proposed grants. So that worked out very well. The biggest grant is on the next slide. Um, so we have an impact grant, and Mayor McEachran was good enough to kind of start us off uh, on base with the kickoff to that grant in June. This is a $10,000 renewable grant program, and it was spearheaded by our Lodge Veterans Committee, very active in the community. And because of the generosity of members and community donors, we doubled the grant, so it became $20,000. Um, because what we found out is that we had such an outpouring of um, tickets and opportunities and we needed to bus at the cost of $1,500 a bus our military to these events and we didn't have enough money in the $10,000 grant so um, we were able to double that grant so the grant project is called link Liberty investments nurture kinships specifically it provides opportunities for us to reach out and connect with the local active duty military. That's not the $8,000 employees at the shipyard, but it's the active duty um, serving on that base. So it's about 400 stationed right in our own community. And we wanna make sure they realize that they have a home here while they're here. And, and that's been extended since COVID. Some, it used to be two years, now it's four years, sometimes five years. And there's an awful lot of those young uh, men and women who really don't get off the barracks much. 
Next slide, please. So after working their long day, they tend to return to barracks and go online, and this is what they've been doing, and COVID did not help with this situation at all. It creates a level of isolation that places them at risk for a number of bad outcomes. So months or years can pass. What we found out after we did a survey is some of the um, young people on the Texas didn't realize we had an outdoor pool. They've been here quite a while. They didn't know we had one. All they have to do is look across from their barracks and, and there it is. Um, so the grant is to basically try and get them more immersed in our community and connected with the seacoast and especially Portsmouth. And the next slide, please. So because of very generous sponsors, UNH Athletics, Bank of New Hampshire Pavilion basically gave us unlimited tickets to every one of their venues. The Portsmouth Music Hall that's now helping us uh, do an all military um, uh, performance. Um, tour of Portsmouth Golf Center, the Gundalow, Strawberry Bank, Bolarama, all of these places contributed um, at no cost, basically in-kind donations. Um, and we've been able to partner with the enlisted men and women on monthly, we, we establish a pet therapy um, program on base that happens monthly now. Uh, we have concert trips, local comedy, music performances, fishing and sailing, and they come to the lodge for basic camaraderie, jumping in the pool, enjoying uh, burger night at the grill room or at our lodge lobster bake. So every one of these events, we try and partner with them, either Elks members and our other partners, Peas Greeters, so that they have some networking because it's a long winter. As some of them have pointed out, many of them from Arizona and Texas, it's a long winter coming. So we really want them to have some networking and some home away from home um, connections before that happens. Next slide, please. These are some of our pictures of, uh, one is the bus at the New Hampshire Pavilion where we had about 60 go and see a comedy routine. We had Red Sox have offered us free tickets for um, some of the home games. And I think that's the charter fishing trip that they went on. We had 43 enjoy the charter fishing trip right, right from um, their backyard, essentially, the uh, back channel is where they were picked up. Next slide, please. So the Portsmouth Elks have contributed over 100,000 in grant funds to local recipients. And there's the list, so many. Um, and that's since 2012. So that was the data that I could acquire from, from our online system because before that, we don't have any online record of that. But we've been quite active in the community and want to continue to be active in the community. <coughs> Next slide, please. Finally, in 2023, 11,000 was donated in school scholarships, including students entering the trades. 9,000 supports Portsmouth Little League, Boy Scout Troops, uh, 164, and the Seacoast Community School just about every year. And we delivered 225 gift bags with cookies, Christmas cards made by local Girl Scouts, and a $25 market basket gift card to elderly residents in Portsmouth housing, and 45 holiday food bis baskets for food insecure veterans and families. And to date, the Portsmouth Elk Veterans Committee has used about $60,000 to distribute, just, actually it's above this now. They've gone over 308 welcome home kits to veterans transitioning from homelessness to a new home through their veteran partner programs. So that's just recent statistics. So other over and above the ENF grants, these are kind of regular charitable uh, events that happen at the lodge every year. Thank you, next slide. So that is our motto. Elks care, Elks share, it's not just a motto. Um, we are here in the community. Um, I really welcome people to reach out if we have uh, a situation that requires volunteerism, uh, sharing and caring, and a grant, um, please let us know. All you have to do is email our secretary and we'll work from there. Thank you, we have some members here, I think. Uh, yes. Please accept the grant for the uh, that's, that's an easy uh, vote to take. Thank you, Elise, for uh, the presentation and all the work uh, that you do uh, on behalf and for Portsmouth. Uh, it is appreciated. Uh, I was lucky enough to attend uh, a recent um, uh, kayaking event 
um, by the invitation of Jim Lee, who's in the crowd uh, this evening. And uh, it was amazing, um, just uh, the enthusiasm of all the members um, to, to help our veterans. Uh, it's, it's some of the best folks uh, in Portsmouth, and we thank you uh, for your generosity in this instance, which I'm pretty sure this will pass, and for all instances, uh, Portsmouth is, is better because uh, you guys uh, do care and you do share. So thank you very much, Elise. Wait a motion to approve and accept the grant as presented. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Next up, we will go back into the um, original programming and open up public comment uh, session, uh, session. So um, first up, uh, Irish Mike on the topic of ethics. Good evening, Mayor. Uh, Michael Harden, uh, Archer Street. Uh, the, last me the last meeting you, you talked about ethics, and uh, uh, normally I don't come to council meetings, so I have no interest in it. I don't believe most of the councillors are, are for, for the taxpayers. Like everybody t talks about ethics, and uh, t t to me, if you're running for a, if for a city council, you, sh you should be a you should be a, a property owner and a taxpayer. If you're not a property owner and a taxpayer, you shouldn't be voting on, on multi-million dollar deals that, that affects taxpayers. And, and, and last of all, you shouldn't be proposing bills that affect, affect the taxpayer if you if you're yourself are not a taxpayer. And, but I, I, since my time over here in the States, I've worked on a lot of campaigns, most Senate campaigns and, and presidential campaigns. And most most states, most states, like to to to, to win a seat, you have to gain 50 percent of the vote. And the, the, the like a lot of states come out and say that's racist. It's, it's not racist. The reason they do that is, like most states, it'll be 40 percent Republican, 40 percent Democrat, and then the, usually 20 percent Independent. It varies from state to state, but it's usually 40, 40, and 20, or sometimes. 70, it fares from different state. The reason they do that, you get in touch with the voters. But you, you come to Portsmouth, like most of the city councillors, uh, they, they, they wouldn't even get elected if it wasn't for out, outside, uh, outside donations. And uh, you, you got to, maybe you got 20, about 20, 21,000, 22,000 residents. Granted, they're, they're not all they're not all voters. There may be 16,000 16, that are voters. But to get a city council seat, if you're getting 2,000 2, votes, two to 3,000 votes, you're guaranteed a seat. So, so that, that you're not even getting in touch. You're not even getting in touch with 20% of the voters. You're not getting 20% of the voters. What, 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 what about the other 80% of the voters? You, you, you don't know what they what they want or what they don't want. Like you, you, you cater to you, you cater to whoever donates to your campaign. You cater to whoever donates your campaign. Not just this count. I'm not just this count. At every count, you cater to whoever they caters to your campaign, and whoever they develop, whoever the city's favorite developer is, you cater to them. If there's taxpayers up here and speaking, you never listen to them. A couple of weeks ago, there was a lady up here. She was talking about budget, budgets and uh, and different issues that, that that's important to every taxpayer, not, not just the taxpayers down here, but the councillors. And uh, she she, she called, you silenced her. And it was an important issue, and it, it, she should have been, you should have suspended the rules so she could finish what she had to say because it was an important issue. And like, uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, any of the councillors, you don't have you don't have ethics. Like you're not getting in touch with the voters, and they need to ch change the way the voting process. Thank you, Mike. Next up, Peter Huda, on parking on the street. That's in quotes. Quotes. Good evening, Peter Huda, 280 South Street. So I'd like to talk to you about uh, something that's under Councillor Bagley's name. Um, it's number two, um, the Mechanic Street request for additional parking. So um, 
I, as I walk my dog down there every day, I've noticed the change that has happened. Um, but I still notice that you have the same problem down there with people parking just about anywhere. So I have a simple suggestion for this parking situation and the RVs and the campers is to paint the parking lines and give people guidance onto what size vehicle can fit in the parking spaces. It, it seems like a, it seems to me like a simple solution. I would strongly suggest you think about that. Um, just to share a few things that happened to me on, on this, um, I owned a camper that was on the back of a truck and my travels took me all over the East Coast, all over the West Coast, all to the parks. If there was no lines marked on the street, it's a free-for-all. If you can get in there, you can park. If there's a line, you have to get into that line or you get a ticket. And I had experienced that also. So I guess my simple suggestion for this solution is paint the parking lines to help people give people guidance onto where they could park and what they could park there. Because the same thing is gonna happen down on Mechanic Street that happened every place else because there's no guidance. And if a camper could fit in there and block traffic, they will. So um, that and uh, the second thing is to thank Mr. Tabor for requesting the FY23 year-end financial update. I am looking forward to getting that, Mr. Tabor. Thank you. Thank you, Petra. Next up, Jim Lee on what day is it, question mark. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council. Columbus Day, observed on October 9th this year, is a powerful commemoration of historical significance. Memorialized as a federal holiday on the second Monday of October, it pays homage not only to Christopher Columbus, but also to the pivotal era he ushered in, an era that ignited European exploration and ultimately led to the colonization of the Americas. And importantly, this day also serves to honor the spirit of those immigrants who shaped our American story. Rooted in the late 18th century when Italian Americans took pride in celebrating Columbus's voyages, this holiday gained official recognition as a national holiday in 1937 under President Franklin D. Roosevelt. Columbus, the symbolic figure of this occasion, is emblematic of an age far removed from the present and marked by vastly disparate values and practices. Critically, the actions attributed to Columbus, such as the enslavement of indigenous populations, must be contextualized within the broader historical framework of the age of exploration. Practices like slavery were not unique to Columbus. They were prevalent among all the European explorers and colonists of the time. Indigenous tribes in the Americas, too, had a history of slavery long before the arrival of Europeans. War and Native American tribes also often engaged in bloody battles, killing many and making slaves of their captives. And modern-day slavery still persists on an alarming scale, with some estimates suggesting there are only 48, 49 million slaves worldwide. More people are held in some form of slavery today than in any other period in history. In light of this, perhaps our energy and focus might be better channeled toward combating these contemporary forms of slavery, such as forced labor, sex trafficking, coerced marriages, and child exploitation. Christopher Columbus, viewed through the lens of his time, emerges as a brave trailblazer who ventured into the unknown, paving the way for the age of exploration in the Americas. His deeds, while distasteful to some, were reflective of the prevailing customs of the times. Christopher Columbus and his crew were courageous explorers who sailed into the unknown and began the colonization of the Americas that led to our modern day society we all enjoy. On this upcoming Monday, October the 9th, I would like to extend an invitation for all to join the second annual unofficial Portsmouth Columbus Day celebration in front of the North Church from noon to 1 p.m. This gathering stands as a testament to the enduring spirit of exploration and discovery and all are welcome to come. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Next up, Sue Paladora on WCN. And just to clarify, that stands for White Christian Nationalist. Oh, okay. um, 
I have heard that term being used way too often lately. And I wanted to make a statement regarding that term. First of all, let me um, define what uh, Webster Dictionary calls a nationalist. If someone believes in loyalty and devotion to a nation, <clears throat> especially as expressed in glorifying one of the nations above all others and, stress, and stressing of the promotion of its cultures and interests. Uh, well, that could apply to me and other persons who put, who put on the uniform of the armed services to fight on behalf of their country. The term white Christian nationalism has been created, I believe, by a Southern Poverty Law Center to besmirch and marginalize Christians who also, and who also to preserve our country and its values. Since when is that a bad thing? Look at all, that, all of the wars we have fought on behalf of our country. Were we not called to be nationalists at that point in time, World War II, World War I, Korea, Vietnam? <clears throat> we love our country. We love the freedom it stands for. So I am Hispanic, but I, you know, I'm white. I could be defined as maybe a nationalist because I really put this country ahead of any other country. I think it's the best country in the world. And having five million people pushing through our southern border tells me so. Not only that, but I admire the spirit of this country. <clears throat> so as a white Hispanic who believe in this country and a practicing Christian, I take exception to this term. I find it hateful, exclusionary, and offensive. Most radicals had never darkened the doorsteps of a church, and trying to associate Christians with them is just create political talking points. Last time I checked, 63% of the American population consider themselves Christians. And I want to ask one of your counselors, I suggest that you find another term to describe racist behavior that is less offensive and more objectionable to a huge majority of people in the United States. White Christian nationalism by itself, as you read it, is not acceptable. You want to create a term that specifically talks about people who have uh, a, that kind of tendency, then find something else. Remove the word Christian from it, because they're not. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. I, I think the, just I try not to respond public comment, I think it's uh, to describe Christians uh, that way. Uh, I can, I understand your position there. I think the idea that to be nationalist, uh, you also have to be white or Christian, I think is uh, the point that we all uh, would abhor in America, where you have to be neither uh, to be proud of this country. And um, with that, we will have our next speaker. Esther Kennedy on Good News. Esther Kennedy, 41 Pickering Ave. So about three years ago, um, the mayor at the time, uh, Mayor Beckstead and I went to visit the governor to talk to him about sound walls. And the governor took our meeting and had some of his people there. We also had um, many opportunities where people couldn't go out to Panaway Manor, different areas around, around along 95 to do the sound, to look at sound walls and have a conversation with state officials. One of those state officials that showed up is now the commissioner of transportation. Last Thursday night, um, Council, er, Peter Huda, Paige Trace, myself, and Bill St. Laurent went to um, meet with our executive council in the annual transportation um, funding and talking about it. And we've attended those meetings regularly, faithfully, for the sound walls. 
Bill St. Laurent spoke last. He did an amazing job. On that night, I was very pleased to hear the Commissioner of Transportation share with us that on April 24th, they will be starting the sound walls of 2024. They've moved it up from 2025. This is fantastic news. Um, and I know Bill, among with Eric Anderson and many others, um, has spent years working on the sound walls, but um, this is just terrific news. And it was really nice to hear. It was really nice to have them um, point out. I'd also like to um, extend a thank you to our executive counselor, um, Stevenson. She has done an amazing job on these sound walls. She's made it a priority and she's worked really hard um, to get these sound walls. So I really am pleased with the amount of time we've put into it and that, that we finally have gotten a great benefit back. So I know Bill um, at that night said he was hoping to have them done before he passed and now they look like they're going to be done. So this is an amazing thing, and um, I want to thank all those people there. And also the other Portsmouth resident that was there talking about other things was Miss Elizabeth um, Bratter, so, or who owns property in Portsmouth. So we did have a contingency. We were one of the few people there um, from any area, um, but we did speak, and we were heard. Thank you. That is indeed good news. I hope uh, Mr. St. Laurent doesn't take it as an opportunity to not live a, as long a life just because we're moving the sound walls uh, into 2024 as they originally there. Um, next up, Paige Trace on the topic. As always, Portsmouth, written in the best penmanship of any Portsmouth resident. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Paige Trace, 27 Hancock Street. Um, as the past speaker said, there were several of us there. The meeting occurred in Dover. It was for District 1, um, and it was attended by DOT, an executive counselor. We did ascertain that, indeed, the sound barriers will be moved up to 2024. Um, that brings me to the change in the ethics by Councillor Cook. Um, by all means, I think what I agree with most is Councillor Cook's last bit that if someone doesn't obey the declaration forms of donors, um, both before and after the election, that it can be taken to the Attorney General's office. I do applaud that. Please do. If the city finds there to be violations, then that needs to go to the AG's office, as it was taken after the last election to the AG's office. I and someone else spent three and a half hours at the Attorney General's office over this issue. Um, so please, Councillor Cook, understand that that's an exciting thing to add. It adds validity to what everyone should be doing, which is being transparent. Um, I do find it a little confusing, though, that uh, Councillor Cook and you and obviously others are members of um, Act Blue, and I find that still a little confusing um, I think I applaud you for being up to date, but anytime you put a large national vehicle uh, pack in between yourself and your donor, however convenient that may be, Act Blue to me would say, I think it's courageous, it's 2023, but it adds a little bit of a fine line there. I, it, it adds it to you being um, up to date with your donor list. And I do hope they give you a very specific donor list through Act Blue. And I thank you very much. Um, and that's all I have to say this evening. Thank, thank you, Paige. <laughs> Checking to see on. Um, Jessica Dolan. Is her hand raised? No. Nope. No hands raised on the. 
uh, public Zoom. on Zoom. Um, so we will move on to public hearings and vote on ordinances and or resolutions. First reading of ordinance amending chapter one, article nine, conflict of interest, mandatory financial disclosure section 1.902, election candidate financial disclosure. I'd wait a motion to pass first reading and schedule public hearing and second reading at the October 16th, 2023 city council meeting. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Councilor Cook. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, this is the first time the council is seeing this tonight for first reading. Uh, these are changes to the, the mandatory dis financial disclosures for elections, specifically the election candidate financial disclosure. Um, I want to preface by letting everybody know this does not go into effect for the current election cycle. This will be in effect in the next round of elections, so in two years' time, if the council approves it. So I think that's very important to remember. Um, it won't impact the elections right now. Um, the governance committee considered this at length and um, decided that it would be appropriate to bring forward these changes in Section C. Specifically in Section C, we're asking for uh, disclosures of contributions made in money, materials, and services. Um, there were some concerns that there had been in the past uh, donations to came, campaigns that were not financial. Um, they were donations of materials um, paid for outside of the campaign and therefore were not disclosable. Um, so we want to make sure that candidates would disclose that they received a certain amount of materials. Um, if they did not, for example, if somebody purchased your signs for you and donated your signs to you, rather than you purchasing signs for your campaign, the candidate should disclose that they received campaign signs. Um, and request if they know the donor what the approximate value was of those signs and disclose that price. So that's the goal here is to make sure that people are not trying to contravene the rules, which the rule is essentially you just close any donation over $100, um, $100 or more. Um, the second part um, in Section F, oh, and I guess I should say we, we wanted to be really clear that sometimes people receive donations that they're not aware of who necessarily made that donation, say somebody makes signs for you and puts them up around town, we would ask that the candidate d then disclose that they received an anonymous do donation, that they were not aware of who the donor was. Um, Section F um, allows us to, to provide violations, the changes here, for specifically those who are not elected to office. I think it's critical to know in the current statute the way it reads, um, really, the violation is re to refer, refer you to the ethics process. But if you're not an elected official or you're not an employee, you're not really subject to the ethics process. And so if we have political action committees taking part in supporting candidates in elections, um, they aren't, um, they aren't, they don't have to, dis if they don't disclose things appropriately, according to our financial disclosure, there is no penalty currently. Um, because you can take them before the ethics board, but um, that penalty is is clearly um, there's no removal of office of a political action committee. So we wanted to give make sure that it was clear here in our provisions that you could refer them to the attorney general's office. That's it. And oh. yeah, I I guess I should say finally we asked also for disclosures to also be listed on the website, the city website. Councilor Cook. Councilor Lombardi? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, we spent a lot of time on this uh, ordinance, and um, we had a lot of input. Um, we continue to have input. I think, I think that it is very good. I think it covers just about everything we need. I am always aware that an ordinance like this can be amended in the future. Um, and may need to be amended, amended in the future. But um, as it stands now, I will vote for this. Thank you, Council Lombardi, Council Morell, and Councilor Denton. Um, I just have a quick question when you talk about money, materials, or services. 
would that include having a group of volunteers canvas on your behalf? I just want to make sure that we're clear on what we're defining as a service. No, we would not consider volunteering a service. We would, all campaigns have volunteers. It's if somebody gives you a service that they would normally charge a large fee for, for anyone else, but then, the, but they're going to donate it to your campaign. Uh, and that service would be worth, say, $250. Um, so you'd want to disclose that. And so it's really $100 or anything more than $100. <clears throat> Councillor Denton. Thank you. I'd like to commend the committee on making these improvements. Uh, the language in here currently under Political Action Committee is actual language which um, I'd initially proposed back in 2017, I believe. The basis for that was uh, the rise of Political Action Committees in Portsmouth. Uh, 2013 was Portsmouth Now. 2015 was, I believe, Portsmouth One. Um, this language was enacted. There's really no Political Action Committee that I'm aware of that was that active in 2017. And 2019, um, Revisit McIntyre came about. Uh, they did not disclose, and the former mayor did indeed uh, file an ethics complaint against the organization, a couple people involved. And then two years later, in 2021, um, the first person to actually, or the first PAC to actually disclose information under this was uh, Progress Portsmouth. And so a couple of points on that. One, I'd like to encourage current PACs that are operating in Portsmouth uh, today, like uh, Portsmouth Pulse, to please disclose, although as of right now, it won't be in the ordinance if this passes to have you refer to the Attorney General's office. Um, second point there, uh, one thing which was not um, included, I tried to shoot for the moon, was having candidates declare how the money is spent. Because just listing how much money a campaign takes in is only half the equation, especially for only taking or required to list contributions of $100 or more. So if someone could theoretically raise, I guess, 10 donations of $99, well, that's $1,000 there. And it'd be nice to know how much money campaigns spend. So an amendment which I plan to offer at the next meeting, at second reading, so everyone knows, would be to close the loop on that, to have campaigns uh, both of candidates and political action committees list what they actually spent on their campaign. Thank you. And Councillor Denton, Councillor Bagley, and then Councillor Cook again. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. And I, I think this is a good ordinance. Um, there's, there's been a lot of kind of scary numbers thrown around. Uh, I'll just, you know, for anybody that wants to run for local office, I raised less than $1,000. I spent less than $2,000, and the vast majority of it was on the signs, which I got to use again uh, for this campaign, so I don't have to spend that money again. Um, I didn't do a mailer. I think those are about $2,000. Um, we don't run ads, or at least I don't think any of us run ads on TV or the radio. Um, running for local office is a lot easier than it is to run for a state office or a national office. And I wouldn't want all of this talk up here to discourage anyone from entering a race. It's, it's really knocking on doors, and it's a lot less about spending money. Yeah, and if you buy signs, don't put the date on them so you can <laughs> reuse them. <laughs> Councilor Cook. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I just wanted to um, make sure everyone is clear that the ordinance as it stands um, requires reporting of expenditures over $100, um, but that's a total figure, not itemized. And so that's, that's really what Councillor Denton is pointing out. Um, our disclosures forms for the last election have already been updated for this election. So anticipate that you're going to see updated disclosure forms this time around for everyone who is running um, that will fit the current ordinance as it stands without these changes. Um, I know that was not included in the last time around, but they are included now from the city clerk's office. So. Councilor Cook, any other questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Next up, first reading of ordinance amending chapter one, article four, section 1.413, sustainability committee. It await a motion to pass first reading and schedule public hearing and second reading at the October 16th, 2023 city council meeting. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Councilor Denton. 
Thank you, Your Honor. I've been a member for, I think, eight of the past ten years on the Sustainability Committee with a two-year gap, or hiatus, as some people like to call it. <laughs> the, um, the one thing that was always discussed from day one is the role of the committee as a Blue Ribbon Practices Committee versus a Standing Committee. Um, those conversations have evolved greatly from when I first became a member of the committee, where everyone was in favor of it remaining that way. Now the overwhelming majority um, of the committee, I'm not, I'm not aware of anyone who does not support becoming a uh, member of a permanent standing committee to make sure it lasts. And the goals which we listed here are pretty straightforward. It's essentially to provide advice and guidance on the implementation of a climate action plan, uh, increasing awareness of sustainable practices for both the city residents and everyone else throughout town, and then standing for environmental justice while protecting our ecosystems. And again, all of that is advice and guidance. It doesn't get in the way of the city manager from running the city. Uh, but this will um, give more credence to what the committee's been doing as a blue ribbon committee for the past 20 or so years since uh, then Mayor Steve Marchand created it. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilor Lombardi, then Councilor Cook. Uh, yeah, I think one of the interesting things um, on this committee is the participation of students. Um, and unlike most committees, some of these students are not residents of Portsmouth. Um, so they are actually representatives of the uh, the school, not uh, not of their homes uh, towns, and I think that's a that's a excellent way to include students who um, are committed and uh, just want to participate in a committee like this. So I, I think this was a very creative way to do that. Councilor Cook. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I just wanted to remind the council this not only had a review by the Sustainability Committee, but the Governance Committee also reviewed it on behalf of um, the council and then sent it back to sustainability, um, and sustainability brought it back forward. Well, uh, I think it's a, a great idea, and the problem with any Blue Ribbon Committee is that they have to be reappointed by the next mayor. Um, I think that <coughs> Uh, a committee as important as this uh, should have the ability to have continuity that lasts beyond any singular uh, mayor, uh, however well-intentioned. And so to stagger terms and work towards that uh, is something that I think would be an immediate benefit aside with the uh, additional benefits of being a standing committee uh, from an ordinance standpoint. So I will also uh, support this and thank you for the efforts to bring forward. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Next up, uh, public hearing, second reading of ordinance amending chapter seven, article three, section 7.321, snow emergency parking ban and chapter seven, article 10, towing section 7.1002, snow removal operations. We will start with a presentation. Is this presentation just Peter coming up and talk to us? All right, Peter, come on up and talk to us. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Mayor, uh, City Council. Uh, my name is Peter Rice. I'm the Director of Public Works. Um, the uh, ordinance change before you this evening is an attempt to streamline uh, our notification and messaging for snow emergencies. Uh, historically, we've added a number of uh, means of communication, which uh, includes uh, uh, banners on Channel 22, uh, website banners, uh, 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 Smart 911, uh, snow phone, tweet, uh, and with all these additional attempts to message, um, we, we've noticed that we actually dilute the message and oftentimes confuse people. Um, and so what we'd like to do in this effort is to streamline uh, the communication process. Uh, we, we will be keeping the, the tried and true snow phone, which is a, a you know, traditional way of people dialing and calling. So if they don't have access to computers or anything like that, they still will be able to get a hold of uh, the snow information. Um, we also are looking at pushing out the Smart 911 
uh, application, which is a great way of being uh, informed of, of a lot of different things uh, relative to either emergencies, police activities, fire, uh, road closures, things like that, and weather alerts. Um, it's a really good uh, means of, of communicating. And then what we would do is we put, would put static information on the website as well as uh, other digital approaches where they would refer people to um, our website to sign up for 911 or to use the snow phone to get um, information. So it's really an attempt to simplify uh, the process. And it, it, if you can imagine um, preparing for snowstorms and staff are oftentimes uh, out straight and, and overtired and it, getting online to edit the city's website to put a streaming banner across it to get, a, get on uh, line to do the uh, TV uh, banners um, becomes very challenging. And oftentimes if there's a meeting going on, the banner gets bumped and so it becomes a, a confusion and then people say, well, I didn't see it on this spot, I saw it in this spot. And so we want to be consistent and make it you know, unified so folks know where to turn to. Um, so that is the intent of this ordinance change. Um, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. Any questions? Councilor Tabor. Uh, thanks, Your Honor. Uh, I'm all in favor of uh, making this simpler, and I think Channel 22 is, is cumbersome for you to use, but um, I would be concerned about not notifying local media. Um, you know, the Seagos Media Group has 15,000 online subscribers. If we're only using channels within the city, what about all those people who come here to work? Um, they access news, particularly during a storm, through Seco's Media Group or Channel 9. And um, I think we have to think about reaching people outside of the city who commute in. So um, that's just the thought. I th there's a large audiences there. When we used to do audience research, we found that particularly in uh, storms or news, news times, uh, Channel 9 gets up to half of adults looking. Sure. So, And, Councilor, it's a great, great point. Um, I have memories of the communications to the various media groups, and more times than not, the response I would get back is, you know, why are you sending me this information? Um, I don't, you know, I, I'm not interested. You need to send it to so-and-so. What having that streamlined uh, Smart 911 really simplified it. What happened is that the folks just got, they signed up for that and they got that message right away. And so it was something that we, you know, you're right, we need to make sure they're aware of it and, and reach out to them. Um, and we have done that in the past and we found that it was very successful. Um, so, you know, people just would, you know. So there's a solution the in place that already. So there's a plan, there's a plan to do that. So yes. Okay. Any other questions? Councilor Moreau, Councilor Denton. Not so much a question, but a um, comment, because uh, I have signed up for the Smart 911, and I mean, I get text messages, voicemails, and emails. So I, one way or another, I'm going to get one of those, and no matter where I am. So I think it is very handy, and I believe anyone can sign up for it. You don't have to actually be a resident. You can Correct. be. Right. Yep. You can be it. anyone from any who just happens to come here a lot. So I think it's a good system. Councilor Denton. I simply want to commend you, Peter. This has come a long way from the days when people have to put down their shovel and call to check the voice message to see if there's a snow parking ban in effect. And I had pushed some time ago for simple texts, and again, this is great. So, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Actually, one question for you, Peter, uh, before you go, you almost can out. We'll continue to have signage in affected areas, is that? Yeah, this, the signs uh, in the spaces that we have now will continue to be there. Okay. Any public hearing speakers? Any? Going once on Zoom. Closing the public hearing. Any additional council questions? Councilor Bagley. Thank you, Aaron. Just, just a quick comment. Um, uh, Director Rice has kind of said this in the PTS meetings. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, if it's snowing outside, 
keep your eyes and, and your ears open to see if there's going to be a snow ban. A lot of communities in New Hampshire, they either ban parking during the winter months or they don't notify residents or visitors at all. So I think it's great that we're going to such great lengths to notify our residents when there's a, a snow ban and, and nobody wants to get caught out in one. Um, but, you know, if, if there's bad weather in the forecast, then, you know, keep your, keep your phone uh, off silent. All right. Anybody want to wager on how much snow we're going to get this year? No. No? <laughs> a little bit? All right. I think it's a lot of bit. All right. Um, I'd wait a motion to pass second reading and hold third and final reading at the October 16th, 2023 City Council meeting. So moved. Second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. We will move on. I think Councilor Cook had a... Councilor Cook? Mm -hmm. Uh, Your Honor, I'd like to suspend the rules and hold third and final reading um, of this ordinance change. Second. Any discussion? The only reason I would be opposed to doing this would be the uh, just another opportunity for folks to be aware of the change on another council meeting that might be watching. So uh, if we could uh, table that to the October 16th meeting or remove the motion, I think. I, that I'd be fine with doing that, Your Honor. So next up, uh, city manager, it says Connor, uh, but it's not. It's <laughs> <laughs> and she took down the, do you have a, uh, it's deputy city manager Woodland and um, uh, you have one item action or just, one. Just one item. Um, so we are here to uh, consider a temporary construction license for 238 Deer Street. Uh, so the owner 238 Deer Street LLC is making improvements to their property. Uh, the owner is constructing a three to four story mixed use building with 21 residential units. And in order to construct the project and provide a barrier for public safety, the owner is requesting to encumber four license areas that abut its property. The requested term of the license is approximately 13 months from October 3rd through uh, the, of this year through October 31 of 2024. So there are basically four license areas, a portion of the sidewalk, two parking spaces, uh, part of a uh, public access easement is uh, impacted, and then a small portion of Deer Street. I'd wait a sample motion to authorize the city manager to execute and accept the temporary construction license to encumber the four licensed areas that abut 238 Deer Street as requested. So moved. Second. Any discussion? For the folks at home, this is the uh, this is the old stadium, uh, the old uh, Legion uh, that is uh, VFW that is uh, uh, that is already leveled. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Next up, the consent agenda. I'd wait a motion to adopt uh, the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We already had the presentation from the Elks Lodge uh, 97. Thank you again uh, for that. Uh, email correspondence, I'd wait a motion to accept and place on file. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, next, we have a letter from Eric Gold requesting for exhibition of artwork at City Hall growing up Portsmouth. I'd wait a motion, uh, a motion to refer to the city manager with the authority to act. So moved. moved. Second. Uh, any discussion on this? Councilor Cook. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, this is a really exciting um, uh, potential exhibition, and uh, I'm, I'm very excited to see it potentially come to City Hall. I hope that we can find a way for that to happen um, because it really showcases um, individuals in our community who've contributed quite a bit to the community and its works of art by members of the community. Yeah, it was pretty impressive at, yeah. at 3S. Councilor Moreau. Do we have enough room? Mm -hmm. In this big building? <laughs> Pro I don't know, somewhere. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they just seem rather large. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. do we have enough wall space? Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> I guess that's, you know, the authority to act. That's the right. manager. It's <laughs> she not can carte figure blanche. it out. We're not going to raise any ceilings. Um, but, uh, all right, uh, I'd wait them. So we have the motion to refer to the city manager of authority to act. Uh, it was seconded. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. 
Any opposed? Uh, next, a letter from Phil uh, von Hermit, uh, Sale Portsmouth, um, requesting the city split the cost of the police department invoice in the amount of $2,619.95 for their traffic detail. I'd wait a motion to split the cost of the police department invoice as requested. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Any discussion? Councilor Bagley. I guess this might be a, a inquiry for the deputy city manager. I think we all know that the weather was pretty atrocious that weekend and that really affected their event. Is this something we've done in the past or is this anything that you're worried about us setting a precedent with? Um, Historically, the city council has adjusted either license fees, for example, for the Prescott Park Arts Festival or for other entities where something like weather, which is hard to uh, anticipate. Um, so we've done something like this before, but it does come before the city council. Okay, thank you. I, I think it's a reasonable request given the conditions and I'll support it. Any other discussion, comments? I too would support this request this seems like a, a reasonable ask and really bummed uh, that the uh, blessing the feet uh, was uh, was canceled because of lightning mm -hmm. um, those posters are probably really valuable now that it never <laughs> never happened right. um, but uh, I never got one <laughs> I have one framed in my house <laughs> so, um, but it's a uh, it was uh, it was sad hopefully we can do a blessing the fleet uh, sometime uh, in the future, I know there was a lot of work that went into that, and fortunately for safety, had to be had to be canceled. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Um, so, uh, under my name, have McIntyre update. Um, there's been no movement from the the GSA. Uh, Senator Shaheen met uh, with uh, GSA Administrator Callahan. Um, prompted a, a letter um, and a letter back uh, saying they continue to interpret the law um, in the way that since they did not build a building, uh, they will not uh, transfer the building uh, to us. Uh, we still have, um, I sent uh, two letters as mayor uh, looking to schedule a meeting uh, with a uh, new uh, a political appointee, a GSA Region 1, uh, General Administrator, Region General Administrator Fran uh, uh, Thompson, he originally scheduled a meeting um, and then canceled that meeting uh, twice, uh, refusing to meet uh, as this was an active, uh, well, gave no reason other than to set the meeting and then cancel it twice. Um, just on a, just a purely, uh, I guess, more personal uh, note, uh, you know, we've had plenty of discussions with you know, administrators like from the small business administrator, uh, they've come, uh, they've toured uh, Portsmouth. Uh, the EPA, we haven't always gotten along swimmingly uh, with the EPA, but because their political appointees continually show up in Portsmouth, we've developed a strong working relationship. Um, you know, as mentioned, uh, and I think mentioned later here, uh, the Department of Transportation uh, uh, Administrator Pete Buttigieg call this to say we were getting you know four hundred sixty thousand dollars they're not all I mean that's an easy call I guess to make um, but I was disappointed that there wasn't um, an opportunity to have a discussion because there's a lot of things uh, and a lot of questions especially around uh, the auction um, and where that stands uh, where uh, they are and in the last count uh, at some point it's eight million dollars and for folks watching at home it resets every time uh, that uh, 24 hours uh, for each bid so I don't know when they couldn't uh, guess uh, when that would be. Uh, there still is, um, outside of the McIntyre uh, property at uh, the Pease Development Authority, which is, uh, was a part of the original, uh, the original legislation that we would assume they would um, no longer have an interest in um, after this. So there's more conversations to have uh, with the GSA along with any license agreement. Um, but. Uh, that is the update uh, as of now, um, and when there is more to share uh, on the uh, the GSA, it doesn't. Uh, we will share it. Uh, there does not seem to be any um, bargaining or just conversation uh, with the GSA, and for that, I don't think it's a great example um, how government uh, should act. But it's the way that uh, they are choosing to engage uh, the city of Portsmouth. Um, with that. We will go on to reappointments to be considered of 
Kelly Delecta to the Board of Library Trustees. Um, that will come up at the next meeting. On to Councilor Tabor. Thanks, Your Honor. Um, I was going to uh, propose a motion that we move to hold a work session with the Police Commission and Community Policing Facility Design Team November 13th prior to the council meeting. And if I get a second, I'll explain it. Second. Um, the uh, design team and two, citi two citizen members, John O'Leary, former counselor, and myself, have been uh, check have been following the progress of this uh, design effort for the new police station. Um, the design team has figured out the program uh, for the space, turned that program into square footage of about 57,000 square feet, and looked at five possible sites around the city. Um, and the design team would really like some feedback on the sites. Um, they've done some so-called test fits of the square footage needed, um, and the sites um, are the existing building, renovation, the lower lot here, um, the uh, ball field over by right aid um, off of uh, Market Street Extension, which is called the Granite Street site, um, the Sherburn School, and um, the field in front of Little Harbor School on uh, South Street. Each of those sites have their pros and cons. I think what the, um, the team would really like is some feedback from the council. Obviously, it gets expensive to do further engineering and research on five sites. So if if the council could give feedback, we might be able to winnow down that list. And I think a council discussion is important because there's other considerations beyond just cost and suitability. You know, we've got competing uses like ball fields. Um, where do we relocate ball fields? Uh, we've talked about housing as an option for Sherburne, and that's a competing use. Um, we've got the current building, if we renovate it, um, impacts the city hall and sets up a chain of events um, because we'd have to modify space in this building too. So those are all the kinds of things that I think um, would be valuable to discuss, um, take an hour and discuss with the council and uh, have the police commission as well. And we thought November, since there might be uh, uh, new members of either body, uh, who we could bring up to speed. Any other discussion? Seems like a Councilor Cook or Councilor Bullock. Thank you, Councilor. Um, Councilor Tabor. I think this is a wonderful idea. Um, I know this has been on the, you know, a priority we need to tackle. So I'm uh, excited that we are all getting on the same table and um, we can help the um, help the planning of this go more efficiently. I think. Great. Uh, I would agree uh, with that and thank you Councilor Tabor for scheduling it after uh, the election uh, regardless of who wins um, you know this is going to be one of the bigger issues that faces Portsmouth uh, in the next two years uh, and should have any uh, council elect uh, be a part of that uh, discussion yeah oh I, I forgot a third citizen member of that team is, is uh, Kate Coyle uh, our Fire yeah. police, police commissioner. commissioner. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I'll say I'll then. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you, Councilor Tabor. Next up, a one more. Oh, Councilor Tabor. that's right. Uh, Peter's favorite. Yeah. I I doubled down this time. Um, <laughs> the sample motion would be: uh, I would move we request a report back from city manager and finance staff on year-end financials um, for FY23, including parking revenue. If I have a second, I'll... Second. Okay. Uh, very simply, um, you know, we take a look at the year-end close. Uh, I think there's good news on parking revenue. Um, as we all know, the vast majority of our parking revenue is paid for by visitors to the city. Um, we try and discount. Um, the amount that locals have to pay. Um, and just a reminder, get your 
uh, get your parking app. That's how you get your discounts. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so I think we could look at that as well as how did we end the year and what's the condition of fund balance um, because fund balance has been an important topic for us, keeping that around 13 percent of uh, total budget. Any discussion? Look forward to it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Next up, Councillor Bagley. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I think we broke these out just in case there was any dissent on the action items. Okay. Um, so I move to approve a renewal of valley license agreement for Port Walk HI LLC for a term of one year. Second. Second. And I'll speak to this quickly. We, these are just uh, kind of standard improvements that we approvals that we do every year um, and then there's gonna be a second one that's more or less the same thing after this okay any further discussion all in favor aye, aye. Uh, I move to approve a renewal of valley license agreement for a parade residence hotel LLC for a term of one year second. Second. any discussion all in favor aye, aye. aye. any opposed and I move to prohibit parking on the land side of Mechanic Street between Hunking Street and Pickering Street. And if I get a second, I'll speak to it. Second. Thank you. Um, so we've had a no parking ordinance for some of the areas down there on Mechanic Street, uh, but they were never enforced with signs and paint. Um, recently, we've had complaints that the fire department and public works uh, trucks couldn't get through because of the way the parking was happening. So what we did is we enforced the existing ordinance. What has happened after that is people have uh, started to park in areas that had never been parking, parked in before, and the problem's actually gotten a little bit worse as far as uh, ingress and egress. And I have quite a few text messages from residents in the area sending me pictures of, let's call it creative parking. So what this would do is address those areas and create a no parking zone so that we can get uh, fire ambulance, uh, DPW trucks, uh, regular uh, vehicles through there without these issues that we're seeing today. Any further discussion? Councilor Tabor. Uh, yeah, I had a question. Um, we had a letter from a resident um, saying that now that we've marked the parking spaces, that's caused people to park just past the marked area. What this would effectively do is there wouldn't be those markings anymore because the whole stretch of street, like the two blocks adjacent to it, would be no parking now on the land side. So right now we've kind of created a little zone that looks like a good place to park but really isn't. Um, and it is permitted by statute and we just need to kind of clean up the statute and prohibit parking on the land side of Mechanic Street. Okay. Thanks. Any other discussion? Mm -hmm. Councilor Cook. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, normally, I, I, I wouldn't speak to this. I think that there's probably going to be um, support for it. Uh, but I should note that I live not too far from Mechanic Street. Um, and I see this happening uh, pretty regularly. It's, it's become almost a daily occurrence. And um, I've witnessed several vehicles struggling to get through this area. So um, I just wanted to thank the Parking Traffic and Safety Committee for um, acting so quickly um, to resolve a problem which is really a fire, um, ambulance, police, and also DPW challenge. So, thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And then the last, oh no, I've got a couple more. Um, <laughs> move to approve recommended changes to sa Chapter 7 as presented. Second. And this is just in regards to the snow ban that we saw the mm -hmm. presentation on earlier. Wait, so um, just so we're clear, these are action items to make this happen as an action item. And so, but we're also doing the ordinance at the same time. Yeah, so normally, we would just approve these action items all as like one sure, not, thing. And then we'll do the but we wanted to pull out the parking because we didn't know if there's going to be discussion on that. So now it makes everything a little confusing. Okay, but just on this, the chapter seven, we, we are. This is the same thing that we're solving with the ordinance, correct? That's correct. But just something that you just 
Okay. So we, we pass it and we'll pass it again on the th third reading. We'll also pass it here <laughs> yes. uh, in case it snows tomorrow. <laughs> Is that right? Okay. All right. Um, it's going to be 80 degrees, but we are covered. <laughs> uh, but there's a, there's a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And then finally, move to I, I move to prohibit parking along both sides of Sagamore Avenue between Shaw Road and Wentworth House Road, contingent on no issue with businesses in this location. If I get a second, I'll speak to it quickly. Second. Uh, this is down where the Golden Egg used to be. Um, it's a fairly dangerous area for pedestrians and bicyclists, and this would aid in making it safer. Um, so. Now what the is the what's the contingent of no problems there, with businesses? Um, there are some businesses on the right hand side in the the business condos there, and w we didn't have a chance to go ahead of time and ask them. So we're going to ask them, and if they say yeah, that's fine, we're going to go ahead and do it. And if they say no, we need the parking, we'll revisit it. Okay. How long? I mean, is this a typical practice that we, we do this? Re okay. That we, right. re that we revisit. Yes, because. Yeah, so typically in parking traffic and safety, we'll sometimes we'll say we're going to do this provided there's acceptance of it. And sometimes we'll go to the residents in an area with the traffic calming and they'll say, no, that's we don't want that. And then we'll not do it. And sometimes they say they want it and then we'll go ahead and do it. Cool beans. Sometimes they say the same thing. Yes. Both things. All right. Uh, we got a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And then finally, this is just to clean up all the last bits that we just did. I move to approve and accept the action sheet and minutes of the September 7th, 2023 Parking Traffic Safety Committee meeting. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, Councilor Blaylock. Thank you, Honor. Um, so we were able to finally have a rec board meeting. We had some difficulty this summer with schedules and there's a lot going on. Um, so we missed some months with the uh, rec board, but we were able to get together. Um, we did put together uh, some operational guidelines for the rec board. Uh, it's got a mission statement, um, operational guidelines, um, functions of the rec board, and those have kind of been sent to legal um, to check with those, make sure those are all good to go. Um, I'm always wearing my skate park, skateboard park pin. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, a lot of you have uh, been driving by it and seen it uh, coming into fruition. Um, we were able to have a skate park uh, meeting. The completion date is still sometime in November. Um, primary structures of the park are nearing completion. They're start, gonna start focus on pouring the concrete for the flat areas. Uh, they do encourage people to stay away off the construction site. It is still a construction site, it's still very dangerous. Um, we would not want anyone to ruin it or cause any damage to it before it was completed. Um, then it would obviously um, add, the, add to the cost and delay the opening of the park. Um, lighting of the park has been equipped with pole mounted transformers instead of relying on a dedicated transformer on a pad. Um, this will allow the lighting to occur much sooner. I believe it will also save us around uh, seven grand. Um, which is always nice to save money. We still will be accepting donations on the city website, um, so don't hesitate there. Um, but the irrigation and water fill stations will be completed, um, will not be available upon the completion of the park, um, and a lot of the plantings that go around the park will be done next spring. Um, so that's an update on the skate park. Um, we were having issues getting buses from the schools to the after school programs at community campus. Um, our um, recreation um, department leader, Todd Henley, has able to work out through a third party that we were able to get buses. Um, the school department is providing bus transportation from Dondero to community campus because both buildings fall in their school district. Uh, but for the other elementary schools and the middle school, I, I we were able to find a third party to provide that service, which is huge because getting kids to these after school programs uh, is half the battle. Um, as far as, um, also we, uh, we know the council voted um, to create a site selection committee for the uh, sports complex. Um, the RFQ process has been completed and both uh, firms were deemed qualified. Um, and I might ask the uh, deputy city manager just to touch base more on that. Yeah, so this site investigation, rather than selection, site investigation committee um, is, or working group if you will, is being, uh, 
formed and I believe they have a meeting scheduled somewhere in mid-October and really what it is is just asking representatives from the surrounding communities as well as you know PDA and other interested parties to tell us what you may have identified for potential public sites in particular so that's kind of piece one do we have any public sites anywhere and then um, there has been some kind of conversation and pieces filtering up of potential private sites but of course those would come with a cost so at the very initial stages really of investigation it's been hard to get um, the representatives together and find a date where, where people could say hey I've got a site um, that might be useful but that's what it is it's really reaching out to those surrounding communities to see what they have together so that's mid-October so hopefully by the end of October early November Maybe we'll have something that is uh, ready to be shared for the next step. Thank you, Council Boylock. Uh, Assistant Mayor. Yeah, thank you. Um, Council Boylock, just a request to um, bring up for discussion or if, if the rec board is already discussed. Um, obviously at the skateboard park, um, next to the skateboard park, we know that we're gonna have some green space, a field there. Uh, just seeing if the rec board has discussed what they think would be best suited there or if that's something that we think that we should have a community work session about I know um, I've said before and I know many community members have mentioned that we only have one right now uh, girls softball field or um, some other recreational fields obviously if we look at the Granite Street lot as a potential for um, a police department and some other needs as in Sherburne potentially um, you know uh, the rehabilitation of Sherburn. Uh, so I just would like to make sure that that's on the rec board's radar and kind of look at the the rec need study and what that field could could become. Good. Uh, yes. Um, originally, so this skate park is just phase one of that um, site. Phase two did incur uh, incorporate a splash pad. I believe it was some sort of pa a passive recreational field. Um, the company that we were, the firm we were working with, they drew up a, you know, a half of a soccer field and put a, a scoreboard up. And I was like, well, why would you need a scoreboard if there's only <laughs> half a field? Um, <laughs> but um, so those, those are still, we know there's still opportunities um, and they're still open for discussion on what will happen there. I know um, originally there was, it was the, I think the original motion was for passive, a uh, passive uh, green space, but um, I'll let deputy city manager. Um, for me. Uh, just so you're aware, the, the back of the, or the rear, if you will, uh, of the property is going to be used or continue to be used for lay down area okay. uh, for some ongoing projects and projects that are in the near term. Um, so I would say there's no rush to okay. figure out what we do uh, with that back section beyond the fence, so to speak, um, as we continue to work our way through some of the you know, pipe, big pipe projects and other road projects that are already uh, in the schedule. So there's time. Um, so just so you're aware. Thank you. All right. Acceptance of, thank you, Councilor Blaylock. Approval of grants and donations. Uh, acceptance of donations to the Senior Activity Center for the luncheon fund in the amount of $500. I'd wait a motion to approve and accept the donation as presented. So moved. Second. All in, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And now back uh, to the city managers for informational items. All right. So first up, as the mayor uh, mentioned earlier this evening, uh, the city has received uh, 460000 in funds from the Federal Consolidated Rail Infrastructure and Safety Improvements Grant. That's a mouthful. For a Bartlett Street underpass engineering study, you have the uh, press release in your attachment. Um, and we're very excited to be able to have some funds to begin the engineering work, or at least the, the first look um, as to what we could do for that intersection. So i um, very happy to see those funds and, and the mayor did get his call. Yep, I'm glad I, I don't always answer the phone. Sometimes I'm busy, but it was definitely an interesting call. Uh, you know, it wasn't bad news at all, so that was great. Um, just a question on this. I know that this is this used to be, um, looked at from a CI, uh, yeah, a capital improvement plan, uh, like way back uh, when. This, you know, is a, a pretty large grant for uh, for engineering work. 
five hundred thousand. Yeah. Um, you know, I think we would all be, you know, we've all uh, made do with the best that we can at that intersection. Um, but if we could straighten that road, if we could improve the bridge, it would be a a big uplift to what we're able to do. And I think that um, you know, from a a rail bridge standpoint, it, it, you know, CSX is probably aligned to the efforts as well from a safety standpoint. I know that um, we've had preliminary conversations uh, with some folks that were uh, concerned about lighting under that um, bridge from a safety standpoint. Would this prevent any action to be taken on that lighting uh, in the immediate term? No, it shouldn't prevent any action on the lighting. As far as I'm aware, Pete, wave at me if I'm wrong there. Um, and it is, um, there is a city match uh, for this money of 115000 So there is some matching funds that we'll be putting in. And then um, we, through this process, I understand we have identified more kind of state funds that could be available in a future if we were to move forward on this, um, as well as uh, additional federal funds. So. Um, Jane Farini and Eric Eby and, and Peter and Suzanne, all the folks that worked on getting this uh, done, uh, really excited uh, as somebody that, well, we all spend a lot of time either hearing about that intersection or going through that intersection. So uh, it'd be great if we could actually uh, figure out a way to make that intersection seem like a reasonable part of town um, and not work with what we have, uh, which is the best that we can get given the bridge. On to the next item. Okay. Um, so the city manager provided uh, an update with regards to the Pease Development Authority. Uh, so the PDA board met on September 21st. Uh, no substantial votes taken on new, uh, on new projects or, or information to share. But of note is that uh, PDA has two new positions, an environmental compliance specialist as well as a greenskeeper. Um, the PDA executive director noted that the three-day air show held on September 8th, 9th, and 10th was successful and safe event, enjoyed by over 100,000 attendees. And the next board meeting will be on October 19th. Any questions? No questions. All right. Next item, outdoor dining update. So as a reminder, the outdoor dining season for all restaurants using public areas comes to a close on October 9th, concurrent with Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, the city has sent a letter to all permittees to remove their outdoor dining setups from city sidewalks and street no later than October 10th. Um, and this is a reminder that DPW of Public Works has scheduled paving projects in some of these downtown locations. And as such, it's very important to keep to the agreed upon deadlines as outlined in the permit and in the correspondence we've been sending out. Um, and any questions can be directed to the Director of Planning and Sustainability, Peter Britz. So. Thank you. All right. Number four. Um, so you have in your packet uh, a report back uh, on the dock request from Paul and Allison Dunn. So at the September 5th, 2023 City Council meeting, the Council voted to refer a written request of Paul and Allison Dunn for a dock on Pierce Island to the City's legal department for a report back, which is attached. And in summary, that report basically says uh, Pierce Island is not a good location. Um, so uh, they will be going back uh, and rethinking uh, their request for how to provide a dock somewhere for their needs. There's that. All right. Um, also in your packet um, and also available on the website, uh, the Portsmouth Cable and Broadband Internet Con Commission conducted a short online customer survey in April of 2023 to assess how well the city's current cable TV services provider Comcast is doing uh, in order to help the, inform the commission's work. Uh, there were 508 responses. Uh, the findings of that survey um, you can find, again, on the city's website under the Cable Commission page. Um, probably no surprise there was um, some unsatisfactoriness and dissatisfaction on some of the services that, that uh, people are receiving. Um, in addition, in response to some of the questions raised by uh, the survey re results and, and the notes that people sent to the commission. We did put an FAQ section on the Cable Commission page to kind of explain 
that the Cable Commission has, shall we say, limited authority to a flag, actually no authority really, to influence packaging and pricing. Um, we, we thought it would be helpful. Plus, we tried to flag sort of some of the alternatives that are out there. Um, you know, some people are deciding whether to cut the cord, and we tried to give a little bit of guidance on what they might want to look at and, and go for understanding what their options might be. So we did update the page. Much thanks to uh, both Stephanie and Monty, who have been helping the Cable Commission um, with both the survey and updating the page um, and trying to get more information out to the public, and we are looking for an additional say, member. I was going to say that. Cable we commissioner. All right. We need another commissioner. Yep, we definitely do. So, any questions? Okay. All right. Final. Okay. Uh, last item. Uh, this is an update of the Municipal Alliance for Adaptive Management. So as you may recall, um, the City of Portsmouth is a participant in the Municipal Alliance for Adaptive Management, along with Dover, Exeter, Milton, Newington, Rochester, and Rollinsford. And this organization was pulled together as a response to the EPA's issuance of its Great Bay Total Nitrogen General Permit. Um, the MAM, as we call it, has been meeting regularly to implement an adaptive management framework to meet the regulatory compliance goals. And so the memorandum that you've got kind of provides a quick summary of how much the MAM has contributed to date towards science um, and other efforts to sort of collaboratively better understand water quality and invest in some projects uh, to help water quality. So. There's a lot of detail in there, but if there are any questions, feel free. But that's kind of the summer we thought you should know that there is a great collaboration that is happening, and we regularly at the uh, meetings have representatives from EPA and DES, as well as Conservation Law Foundation. So it's a way to kind of collectively and efficiently put some issues on the table um, and discuss them. So it's becoming very effective, I think, in that sense. Thank you, uh, Deputy City Manager, City, Acting City Manager Woodland. Great job. Uh, any questions on the informational items? Uh, Councilor Lombardi. Yeah, uh, just to mention that October is the American Archives Month. And um, it's just a recognition of the importance of archiving uh, historical documents. And uh, I wanted to just uh, report back that the committee that is studying a public-private uh, archive for the city of Portsmouth um, has um, made great progress. Um, we're working on our report, um, and we are going to have a, a public input session uh, at the Levinson Room at, at the public library on um, November 14th in the evening, and um, I would hope that anyone interested would come, and uh, we're going to do a presentation of what some of our findings and also ask for any further input before we finalize our report. Council Lombardi, any other miscellaneous? Council Moreau. Um, I'd just like to, one, thank all the counselors for coming out yesterday and helping at the great community picnic that we had. Um, it was a sponsored event, so I'd just like to take this opportunity to really thank um, some of the sponsors who helped provide all the food that we served out for free, um, like the Portsmouth Collective, Flatbread, Peace Development Authority, Jimmy's. There was just a whole list of folks that really stepped up on top of the Libri group, getting us volunteers for actual chefs that knew what they were doing. It was very exciting. <laughs> yes. Yes. When we signed up Save to cook. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I said, no, and we had all we could do to put the Putting burgers together. The on, yeah. was, the restaurant door here, yeah. I was like, y'all are crazy. Yes. Yeah. Really like, yeah. We would start talking. <laughs> Burgers would have been burned. It was but very they were stressful at times when you looked up and you just saw yeah. hundreds of people. Yeah. <laughs> How many burgers did we serve? Around 700. I, I can tell, I don't know. I don't know if Kate knows the exact number, but we served all the burgers that we brought. <laughs> I was told it's 700, um, but we also served most of the hot dogs and we also served all the veggie burgers. burgers. And so, yeah. um, and there was a lot of pizza. 
Oh, yeah. Thank Pizza, you, flatbread. Ice cream, flatbread, yeah. And thank Gather for being there and letting us use their refrigerated truck to keep things cold while we weren't cooking them. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think that everyone thinks it was a really great event. Yeah. Something for the council to consider for next year. Yes, it w well, I thought well, the rec know, department. it was a... It, it was fantastic and it, it was a sponsored event to to make it uh free i think you know it, it seemed like a like an awesome lawn fet uh just a, an amazing time um and just a you know everybody would have shown up in the rain i am positive of that but the fact that it was was <laughs> sunny <Beautiful day. laughs> uh, some of the the sponsors i think um uh ac hotel the hotels residence in hampton Inn suites the uh, the Port Walk place. There's just a lot of people in the community that mm -hmm. came out um, to, to make it a really great day um, and a lot of volunteers um, that worked really hard um, and it was you know a really proud day uh, for Portsmouth uh, to have everybody there. Assistant Mayor. Your Honor, thank you. And in that um, spirit of gratitude, I'd just like to thank everyone who came to the uh, third annual New England BIPOC Festival. Yeah. We had uh, roughly um, 3,000 people throughout our 12-hour day. Um, and so I want to give a big thank you um, to the Portsmouth uh, Fire Department. We had a fall right as we were opening our gates, so we had to get the ambulance in there really quick, and they wow. were amazing. Uh, also to uh, the police department uh, for being you know, amazing on site. Um, and then just to the community who has really supported and lifted this event up uh, for the last three years. Um, I want to thank all the counselors who were able to make it, uh, the residents, you know, the feedback we constantly are getting um, is that every year it's growing, it's bigger, it's more inclusive, it's so family friendly. Um, and this year we were lucky enough to have the um, um, Consulate General of the Republic of Korea there and the mayor and him exchanged gifts and so that was really wonderful. It's really, um, we know that as we, as we always say, it's, it, Portsmouth is a city of the open door, and I think this is one of those events that really uh, is starting to get some national traction and in, in, um, notoriety. And so it's really, it's really great. We had people that um, came, you know, from Connecticut, from Vermont, um, a, a couple from Quebec. They were like, we were driving down and heard about this mm -hmm. and saw it, and we saw it in the newspaper, and so we came. Um, so it's been really great to see that. So I just again wanted to give a big thank you to the community who supported the event and were able to come. And thank you, Assistant Mayor, for leading uh, that charge. Portsmouth is definitely richer uh, for all the effort that you put into that. And I think everybody in Portsmouth look forward to how big it's going to be uh, next year. And the other members of your committee, David Vargas? Yes, Davis, and... Chef Davis Varga, David Vargas, Chef Evan Mallet, um, and Marie uh, Collins, who's a PhD um, student right now at the University of New Hampshire. All right, great job. all right, we're we can go all night because it's eight. We don't have to. You know, but <laughs> no, no. We any don't other? Have to. <laughs> I one more. All right, Councillor Blayla, um, bringing us. <laughs> sorry. Um, so this Friday night, October sixth, uh, Portsmouth High School and Oyster River uh, Clipper Cats are. Um, we're doing a salute to service. So we're inviting all first responders, uh, active military, and veterans um, to come to the game. We'll be giving you a ticket for a uh, free hot dog and drink. And we'll be honoring you on the field at 6:30. The game starts at 7. We are playing the Exeter Blue Hawks. Uh, both teams are undefeated in New Hampshire, uh, so it should be a good game. Any other miscellaneous? Go Clippers! All right, uh, I'd wait a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Good night, Portsmouth. <laughs>